Hi everyone, today we're going to be learning about um, astrophysics. Uh, it's chapter 19 of OCR called STARS and uh, we, were going to, we will be looking at the astrophysics side first. Um, especially we're going to start with um, uh, some specific key terms that you need to know like planets, planetary satellites, comets, solar system, galaxies and the universe. It's quite simple actually at this stage. Um, then we're going to be looking at the formation of a star um, in terms of some key uh, uh, terms that you need to know. So interstellar dust, gas, gravitational collapse, fusion, radiation, and gas pressure. So these are the words that we, we will see a lot. Um, we will also look at uh, how low mass stars uh, like our sun evolve into a red giant white dwarf. Um, the characteristics of a white, white dwarf. Uh, we will also talk about electron degeneracy pressure, which you don't need to know too much in depth, but uh, you will understand what will, why it will be useful when we look into the stars and this uh, chandra sekar limit. Uh, we will also look at the evolution of massive stars uh, into red supergiants and then either a neutron star or a black hole after a supernova. Uh, you do need to know a few of the characteristics of the neutron star and the black hole. And we'll also look at the Hertzsprung uh, Russell diagram. Uh, and uh, this is quite a unique diagram, actually, because it doesn't behave like any other graph you've seen before. But it, it helps basically classify stars. Um, so we'll begin first with the key terms. Now, to begin with, the universe is everything that exists. So everything that we can see, everything that we cannot see as well. Um, so for example, galaxies and stars, we can, uh, we can see them, um, but we can't see radiation like microwave radiation, infrared radiation and so on. Uh, we can either see dark energy and dark matter, but we know that they exist because they are contribute, contributing to some other factors that we will see in the next chapter 20, cosmology, when we look at dark energy and matter and its purpose behind uh, why uh, they are um, theoretically assumed to exist. So um, the, for your course only, for OCR A, A levels um, 2009 spec, um, we are looking only at a few objects within the universe that you need to know about, planets, planetary satellites, comets, solar systems, and galaxies. There are a few more like asteroid belts um, and so on, but um, we will just focus within the first bits that you're asked to remember. So for a planet, uh, to be classified as a planet, uh, it's a massive object in orbit around the star. A star. Um, it will have a large mass enough for its own uh, gravity to give it its round shape. There's no fusion reactions taking place in planets either. Um, but basically a planet will have cleared its uh, path around a star from any other objects by gravitationally attracting it because it's quite massive enough as it is. Um, otherwise, it would not be classed as a planet. So, for example, we have uh, dwarf planets like Pluto. Um, Pluto has not cleared its path, it's not massive enough um, to also have cleared its path and so on. So it's classed as a dwarf planet. Uh, planetary satellites are uh, bodies in orbit around a planet, not a star. Uh, in this case, um, we have uh, artificial satellites and um, natural satellites. Artificial are the ones that humans put around uh, planets, in orbit around planets. Uh, but moons, like our moon, the Earth's moon, are um, uh, natural satellites. Uh, comets are just simply ice, dust and small pieces of rock stuck together. Um, they all orbit the sun, so those are the key features that we talk about when it, it comes to this, um, discussing objects within the universe. Our solar system is basically uh, contains one star, which is the sun, and all the objects that orbit it. That's what a solar, is, solar system is. It contains a star and all the objects that orbit that star. Um, galaxies are just simply a collection of stars, planets, and interstellar uh, dust and gas. And they're all held together by gravitational forces, something that we will see uh, coming together in the next part of this lesson in terms of the uh, star. 
And um, yeah, our galaxy is the Milky Way. It contains hundreds of billions of stars and most of them, uh, sorry, a galaxy can contain hundreds of billions of stars and most of them have their own solar system. So we have already finished the first part. This is about the different objects that you can find in the universe. And we'll have a look at the formation of a star. So this is where things get more interesting. Okay, so even though the stars are not living beings, they don't have like they don't really get born or die in the way that we do. Um, they do have their own um, evolution through time. They do uh, change in their own way uh, through time. So they do start somewhere, and that somewhere is called a nebula. Um, the nebulae are just simply gigantic clouds of interstellar dust and gas, which is mainly hydrogen. We will see, uh, when we look at the Big Bang Theory, we'll see how um, mostly it was hydrogen in the, um, well, from the beginning of the universe. It was energy, which um, uh, turned into matter through pair production, and hence why hydrogen was the most prominent uh, element uh, throughout the universe but we will come across that later on in the next chapter so like we said nebula is where stars are born that means that um, you have all these gas and dust uh, usually left behind by a supernova uh, but we'll come across that as well uh, near the end of the lesson um, they form over millions and millions of years so these nebulae don't just exist they could form over millions of years or uh, as a result of a supernova um, and what happens is you have all these little tiny uh, particles that are far away and we know that every single thing that has mass we have seen this in chapter 18 gravitational fields any anything any matter that has mass obviously <laughs> will be attracted to each other so there is an attractive force between matter that end up attracting each other. Um, so through these tiny gravitational attractions, all the dust and gas starts coming together, closer together. And the closer it gets, the, the further the gravitational collapse accelerates. Uh, so these particles will end up getting closer and closer. And we know that from the fact that uh, Newton's law of gravitation at the force is directly proportional to one over r squared. So if you um, half the distance, then you could travel the force acting between them and so on. So this is a quick reminder here that, you know, you can bring in your knowledge from previous chapters to um, understand what's taking place. So, yeah, the closer they get together, the faster they get closer uh, as well. And this starts forming denser regions within the nebula. Uh, obviously, they're not uh, very uniformly distributed. So let's say this was the dust, uh, the cloud of dust and gas. You will have certain areas where there are already particles closer together, so they will form denser regions in that nebula. Now, what happens when matter gets close together? So when these denser regions start forming, well, every time you have matter getting closer together, there will be more collisions. There will be uh. Uh, faster motion, they will be colliding a lot, uh, they will move faster, and we know that that increases the speed of the gas. Uh, that means that gonna, what we will have is that gravitational potential energy from the gravitational collapse will be transferred into thermal energy now. And since there's a denser region uh, that forms in the nebula that starts getting hot, we call that the protostar. Um, now, a protostar is a very hot, dense sphere of dust and gas. So it's like it looks like there's a disk around it of more gas and dust, but the main one is in the center, the protostar. A protostar is not a star yet. Okay, the only way for a protostar to turn into a star is uh, once nuclear fusion is initiated in the core of the protostar. Uh, that's when it goes from a protostar to an actual star. Um, but for that to happen, there obviously needs to be extremely high pressures and temperatures. Now, why is that? Well, you know that if you have, uh, uh, if we have nuclear fusion from, uh, our, from our topic chapter um, 24, we, uh, chapter 26, nuclear physics, we learned that in nuclear fusion or fission, 
uh, energy is always released depending of up to what element is formed so we'll come back to this again in a second uh, but in nuclear fusion fusion you have two small nuclei or more uh, joining together so fusing together joining together to form larger nuclei just a little tip here, do not say atoms, that's not accepted in exam boards, especially for A-level, they're quite strict on that. Um, so, yeah, like we said, so if I want nuclear fusion to take place, I need to have high temperatures and pressures uh, at the same time. And that's because if I want two nuclei to come together, I know nuclei are positively charged overall. So if I want them to come and join together, there needs to be something that overcomes that extreme electrostatic repulsion between them so in that case i showed two hydrogen nuclei so they're positively charged in order for them to fuse together we need to overcome the electrostatic repulsion for the strong nuclear force to bind them together so um that's why we need uh those uh really high temperatures and pressures uh, because it will push them quite close together they will overcome the electrostatic repulsion by overcoming the um uh, forces between them so um now we said for a star to be born fusion is to take place so a protostar is not yet a star it's actually nothing until it ha it, it reaches those uh, right temperatures and pressures okay so once it becomes a star then what well the star will actually live uh, in a stable equilibrium for quite a while um the there are two things taking place during that time. So you have fusion uh, reactions taking place, which means that in each fusion, if you have a, a proton and another proton, which is just um, helium nuclei, right? Uh, heading towards each other to combine, to join together into a uh, deuterium nucleus, for example, um, which is an isotope of hydrogen. Then when they collide with each other, what you have is photons being emitted in uh, opposite directions. Now, um, this is what we call the uh, uh, radiation pressure. So since they are, the pressure is outwards, it's actually pushing the star to expand outwards. We call this the radiation uh, pressure. Equally, since you have a gas, uh, since, star, uh, since stars are basically a huge uh, cloud of gas, um, you also have the gas pressure pushing outwards. So what you see in this diagram is the gas pressure and the radiation pressure pushing outwards. However, you also have gravitational force uh, that's pushing inwards, that's collapsing the star into itself. Now, there's a balance between radiation pressure and gas pressure with gravitational attraction that's outwards. This balance between the outward uh, uh, forces and the inward gravitational force is what keeps the star in a stable equilibrium. They are balanced, so the star will remain like that for quite a while. Uh, we call this stage the main sequence uh, phase of a star. Uh, and that's where the star will be most of its life. So it will go from uh, forming in a nebula to a protostar to actual fusion taking place, which forms uh, the star. And this is the main sequence where it will be for most of its life. It will, it will continue to remain in that phase now after this stage there's two things that could happen to a star depending on its size so if they have different masses oops if they have different masses then they will have different endings um, for the purpose of this um, course we will uh, talk about the solar mass uh, as an, a capital m with that little circle and a dot in the middle which is the mass of the sun, basically. So this usually represents the mass of the sun. And um, why why do we even care about the mass of the stars? Why would that matter in terms of how it ends its life or not? Well, we're going to have a look at that. So before we move on, um, just a quick look at what you we could see. Um, you can see here a nebula with the protostars forming. Now, depending on their sizes, if it's something similar to our sun, then you will expect it to go through um, 
its uh, main sequence phase, then uh, as a red giant, uh, then as a white dwarf, and then as a black dwarf. Now, if it's bigger stars uh, than our sun, and we're going to see by the factor of how much bigger they are, um, they could form into, still go through their uh, main sequence phase, then they will become red supergiants, then there will be a supernova in both cases, and then after that you either get a neutron star or a black hole. So we will come across this in uh, today's lesson. Okay, so why does the uh, mass of a star matter in terms of how it will evolve uh, through its lifetime? Well, if you think about how um, if you, low mass stars sh would be much cooler compared to massive stars since they'll have less matter, so less collisions, lower temperatures, um, that means that they will uh, go through their hydrogen fuel in uh, the biggest stars will go through their um, hydrogen fuel much quicker since they have higher temperatures compared to uh, smaller stars. So more massive stars, the larger stars, will remain in their main sequence less time thus than smaller stars. Um, so basically our sun is good because um, our sun will not go through its fuel, um, hydrogen fuel so quickly. So it'll, be a, it's still got billions of years until it actually runs out of its hydrogen fuel. Um, but big stars, unfortunately, don't um, get to live longer because they go through their fuel much quicker because of their high temperatures due to their high mass. Okay, so for what happens uh, after the main sequence uh, phase uh, of a small uh, star like our sun? Well, if we have uh, stars between half to ten times the mass of our sun, this is what this means, half to ten times the mass of our sun, um, then what you will expect is um, that it will move off the main sequence uh, star and first become a red giant before turning into a white dwarf. Now, the process usually begins because the hydrogen, most of the hydrogen nuclei present in the core of a low mass star have been fused into helium. Uh, nuclear fusion obviously will stop since uh, there will be no more fuel. This will mean that the radiation pressure acting outwards will also stop and the star will experience a net inward force due to, to, due to gravitational attraction. So when we saw in the main, main sequence stage, we said that the radiation and uh, gas pressure that were outwards were balanced by the gravitational attraction that was uh, inwards. But in this case, without any of the pressures outwards, you will have more of the pressure inwards. This means that it will lead to the core contracting, so the inner core of the star will contract, leading to an increase in temperature as it gets um, uh, compressed. Uh, there will still be quite a bit of hydrogen gas around the core, so if we imagine that uh, this is the core, uh, let me draw this yellow, so this is the uh, core and around it um, you have still uh, hydrogen gas everywhere, obviously remember it has expanded as well, so I'll go into it. Now even as the core gets compressed, it gets hotter and hotter and the hydrogen gas around uh, the core is still there there's still quite a bit of hydrogen um, this hydrogen will become hotter as the core continues to contract and it will release thermal energy now the outer layers start to expand uh, to cover a greater volume than the original star was because they're cooling and leading to the formation of a red giant so from as the um, so a small uh, size stars move from the main sequence stage to the red giant. The biggest reason behind this is because uh, hydrogen usually runs out. So that's, the, that's what causes it to begin with. Now, there will be constant contraction of the core by the gravitational collapse, which will continue. That means the temperatures will still rise and eventually the core will still become hot enough for fusion of hel helium nuclei to take place, which will produce um, heavier elements, including carbon and oxygen. 
Now, a huge amounts of energy are released when these fusion reactions takes, take place, uh, including the radiation pressure outwards. Um, now, once the fusion of helium finishes, um, usually a low uh, mass star cannot get hot enough for further uh, fusion reactions, so fusion will stop completely. Uh, so that means that the star will become unstable and it will begin to collapse again. Um, this is where the outer layers of gas are ejected back into space to form a planetary nebula. Uh, but the rest of the star continues to collapse under its own mass and it heats up uh, until it reaches a point where it can't collapse anymore. Uh, this is the point uh, that I will uh, go into in a second. So, um, like I said, you see how the main sequence low mass star turns into a red giant, then it leaves a, a white dwarf uh, in the center with the planetary nebula drifting away into space. Um, so what's left behind is a hot core, uh, which is known as a white dwarf, where there's no more fusion taking place and its temperature is about uh, 30,000 Kelvin. So if there is no fusion, then why is it still white? Uh, why is it still called a white dwarf? Even though there's no fusion reaction taking place, but the star does continue to radiate energy, it's because the photons produced from past fusion reactions leak away. Now eventually this white dwarf will cool down uh, when the surface temperature drops to just few Kelvin and uh, they they say will form a, a black dwarf but one hasn't been observed yet because uh, for a black dwarf to form it will take a longer time than the age of the actual universe that it is uh, already now so obviously it hasn't had time to form yet. So what also what keeps a white dwarf from uh, constantly uh, collapsing from uh, and under its own gravitational collapse? Why if it's got no outward, so this is the white dwarf, and we know that it's got gravitational force pushing it inwards. Why is it not collapsing further? Why is it not getting smaller and smaller? Why is there not development in it still? Well, that has to do with um. Uh, the Pauli exclusion principle uh, that has to do with quantum physics uh, that states that two electrons cannot exist in the, en in the same energy state. Um, so when the core begins to, um, when, when matter in the core is compressed into a very small volume, so like in the white dwarf, um, the electrons uh, are no longer free to move about between energy levels. So when the star contracts, the compression forces the electrons in neighboring atoms into lower energy levels first, then into higher and higher. However, uh, when all the energy levels are, are occupied, um, you can't squeeze more electrons to occupy identical states in an energy level at the same time. Um, so you can't add another electron to a given volume. Um, it, it's as if the electrons are repelling each other with an outward force. So in this case, it's like we have the electrons pushing back. Since they don't want to be in the same energy level, you can't force them. It's like a, a, this um, a pressure that's outwards. And we call this uh, electron degeneracy pressure. Hence why the white dwarf doesn't keep on uh, collapsing. Now, that's obviously different for um, stars that are more massive uh, because they will have uh, a, a limit. There, there is this uh, Chantre Sakar limit um, that uh, the electron degener degeneracy pressure applies up to. Um, so it's only sufficient to prevent gravitational collapse if the core has a mass less than 1.44 uh, times the mass of the sun. So, so 
So for a white dwarf to form, the star has to the star's core to be fair to be more precise has to have a mass that's less than one point four four times the mass of the sun, uh, which we call the Chandrasekhar limit. Uh, so you do need to remember that as well. Good. Okay, so we said, well, after white dwarf, the core will not collapse any further. That's very important. That's because the electrons cannot exist in the same energy level. We call this the electron, due to electron degeneracy pressure, uh, which prevents any further gravitational collapse. And this only applies to cores with less mass less than 1.44. You do need to know what this limit is called which is the Chandra Sekar limit. You need to know this part as well. Okay, so having a quick uh, check through our uh, learning objectives, uh, we looked at how the star forms from interstellar dust and gas, so in the nebula. Uh, we also saw how the gravitational collapse allows these particles to come close together to increase the temperature and uh, eventually protostar forms where fusion uh, takes place and therefore you have radiation and gas pressure that are outwards that are balanced by the gravitational forces that are inwards. That's where you have a main sequence stage. We also looked at the evolution of a low mass star like our sun to red giant white dwarf and its planetary nebula. We also described why a white dwarf doesn't further gravitationally collapse we linked it to the fact that it has electron degeneracy pressure, which is outwards, uh, which prevents further gravitational collapse uh, only and only if the star has the Chandrasekhar limit, so its core is less than 1.44, the mass of the sun. You do need to remember this, it's very important. So uh, the last bits that we will look at are the evolution, is the evolution of the massive star, uh, and also the hertzsprung russell diagram. So what about stars that are 10 times uh, and more than the mass of our sun? Well, they have more man mass, so they are much hotter and they do consume their fuel much quicker. Um, so whereas a small uh, mass star will live billions of years, a large mass uh, star will live uh, so. The small mass will live billions of years. The uh, large mass star will live for millions of years. Um, so it's a much bigger difference in, t in, time, in terms of how long they get to live. Now, once again, it's quite similar here with the small stars, but there's a few changes due to their masses. Um, so when larger, more massive stars move off the main sequence, um, they are already much brighter than the lower mass stars. Uh, Obviously, they will uh, start running out of hydrogen, which means that uh, you have no more radiation or gas pressure outwards. Um, and uh, that means that the core will start to gravitationally collapse um, while the outer layers expand to many, many times the star's original size and it becomes a red supergiant. Um, so is the outer layers that tend to expand, sorry, the, um, so as the car, as the core keeps collapsing and heating up, it will cause further nuclear fusion, uh, in the core, uh, with heavier and heavier elements, um, as it will be easier for heavy, heavier elements that have a bigger positive charge and repelling each other with a stronger force, uh, to, joined together since the more massive star has higher temperatures and pressures compared to a small one. So it will be possible for a, a massive star to keep uh, uh, collapsing and keep fusing and, and the temperature keep increasing and the pressure increasing, causing fusion to take place for heavier and heavier um, elements uh, throughout this whole uh, time. Now, in each stable fusion phase, the degeneracy pressure of electrons and radiation pressure will prevent the gravitational collapse. 
uh, fusion will continue to take place until an iron ore core is built up. Um, this is the core that will then collapse after. Um, however, uh, in a massive star, what you will notice is the layers that it forms. So you will have, let's say this is the star, in the center you will have iron. That will be the highest element formed, the biggest element formed in a star is iron. Uh, and that's because if you look back at the uh, chapter 26, we have seen the binding energy per nucleon uh, against the nuclear number. And we saw this graph that peaks at different points and then you have a really good uh, clear peak at iron up to here. Now we said elements are on this side. When they uh, fuse together, they release energy up to iron only. Oops, up to only iron. However, elements on this side uh, release energy by fission naturally um, up to that, up to iron. Now, beyond that point, if we were to fuse elements together that were big, that have a nuclear number bigger than iron, that means that we will need to give it energy um, for them to form. So this is where your synoptic link and knowledge comes in to make you and help you understand uh, why we can't form any elements that are bigger than iron in a star. Uh, it's quite important, actually, uh, to link these things to two things together so if smaller elements below iron fuse together they release energy in that reaction but beyond it they will have to you will have to give energy to uh, those uh, elements bigger than iron to form um, <coughs> and this is something that happens actually in the supernova explosion so we are all made of stardust we are all made of iron, uh, elements that have been formed in a star and in the death of a star Okay, so we said since uh, iron uh, nuclei cannot fuse together, um, then fusion will stop. And this is exactly what will happen again, that happened in uh, the low mass stars, is that it will start again the gravitational collapse. Um, so this is basically what will lead to the death of the star. And usually it's in a catastrophic uh, explosion um, of the core, uh, well, it all the material will be ejected in every direction in space. Now, this extra energy released in a supernova is being taken in by the uh, heavier elements and they fuse together into um, bigger elements that exist in the whole uh, on, on Earth as well. Also, another uh, big part of um, this uh, final uh, collapse of a red supergiant is the um, immersed gravitational pressure that forces protons and electrons in the iron to combine to combine to become neutrons. Um, and this is what kind of triggers this explosive uh, blowing out of the outer shells. Uh, this is what basically we call a supernova. So um, like we said, elements heavier than iron cannot be produced by fusion in stars. However, in the supernova, uh, elements heavier than, element can, that, than iron can be formed uh, from the remaining heavy nuclei uh, where they fuse together. <coughs> okay, so great. We spoke about how you have a red supergiant uh, forming. Then we also talked about how when fusion finally seizes up to iron, uh, the star will become so unstable it will collapse that it will uh, explode. That will uh, explode into a supernova. Then what? Then what do you get from a supernova? Would you get a neutron star or a black hole? So this is the uh, one of the, not last bits that we're going to see, but one of the last bits. Okay, so um, what happens after the big explosion was left behind from a massive star? Well, the one thing that can be left behind is a neutron star. So if the mass of the core is greater than the chantre sekar limit, so greater than 1.44 times the mass of the sun, then what you have is a neutron star. 
he gets his name because it's mas- mostly uh, made of neutrons. And uh, if you remember what we meant by that Chantra scar limit, is that uh, you will no longer have so. Um, you will no longer have the um, electron degeneracy pressure. It will be greater. The gravitational collapse will be greater than the electron degeneracy pressure, which would bring the fo- protons and electrons in the star to combine and form neutrons um, due to that gravitational collapse being greater than the um, degeneracy electron. Degeneracy pressure. Degenera- g- degeneracy pressure. Um, so, like I said already, they're mostly made of neutrons. You do need to know a few key features. They are very, very small, so about 10 to 20 kilometers across in diameter. And um, they also have very small mass, so two times the mass of the sun. Um, the density is extremely high. Don't know if you remember when we were calculating the density of a nucleus of an atom. Well, that's how dense it is. So they're very, very heavy. Um, so uh, not only are they very dense, but some of them can also rotate very fast. Um, you might have heard about pulsars before. So um, neutrons can basically emit uh, beams of waves as they rotate. And because the, these beams uh, uh, look like flashes of a lighthouse... Um, they're called the pulsing neutron stars, pulsars, basically. Um, so you might have come across this if you already look into uh, astrophysics and you're interested and you read into it. So another uh, possible um, evolution of the star, if its mass core was greater than three times the masses of the sun, is a black hole. So after a supernova, you can either get a neutron star or a black hole. Um, <clears throat> now, like we said, uh, the core will continue to contract uh, until neutrons are formed. So uh, even though um, neutrons will form, the gravitational force on the core um, will be greater now in this case because it has more mass. So the neutrons can't withstand this gravitational force, the star, so the star will continue to collapse. Um, so in other words, the neutron core will further collapse to a singularity, something extremely dense. Um, and uh, basically, it's a point that all the laws of physics break down completely. Now, the escape velocity, which we have seen before in uh, gravitational fields, is the, velocity, is the velocity that an object will need to have, um, to, will need to travel at in order to have enough kinetic energy to escape a gravitational field. Now, when a massive uh, star collapses into an infinitely dense point, um, then a region around it has such a strong gravitational field that it becomes a black hole. Um, an object whose escape velocity is greater than the speed of light only uh, can escape. So if you enter this region, there is absolutely no escaping, not even light can escape it. Um, we call this the event horizon. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this, but you should be, be aware of these uh, key terms. So the boundary is called the event horizon. Uh, at the event horizon, the escape velocity is equal to the speed of light. So light has just enough kinetic energy to escape the black hole's gravitational pull. Uh, however, the radius of a black hole is considered to be the radius of the event horizon. So past that point, everything, including light, can do nothing but travel further into the black hole. Now, uh, there Black holes can be a, a lot of different sizes, including uh, supermassive um, black holes as well, that are considered to be uh, in the center of most of um, every galaxy. So astronomers believe that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy because as um, uh, light uh, or stars get closer to the event horizon of the black hole and begin to be consumed, they get very hot and uh, and produce very intense radiation. So it appears that the center of galaxies is very bright. 
So they are assuming that there should be a supermassive black hole in the center of each galaxy. Okay, so we have seen uh, the evolution of a massive star into a red supergiant and then either a neutron star or a black hole uh, after the big explosion of a supernova. Uh, we also talked about a few characteristics of a neutron star and a black hole. And now we're going to have a look at the hertzsprung russell diagram. <clears throat> okay, so for the last bit, uh, it's got to do with the hertzsprung russell diagram. Now, this is a very well uh, put together diagram in terms of um, looking at how uh, stars can be classified or um, how to view them on a graph. And you can see that it gives you a clear shape of the graph as well when you do plot them. So basically what it shows is the graphs of stars in our galaxy. You do need to know uh, how to sketch this graph. And the easiest way I remember, usually I'll tell you as well how I remember it, but you do need to know what is plotted against what. So what does the hertzsprung russell diagram have as axis plotted against what? So it's luminosity versus the average surface temperature of each star. There's quite a lot of key features in this graph. Uh, so one of them is the luminosity, which increases normally uh, on the y-axis uh, as you go from um, the origin to the maximum value. And you also have it plotted against the uh, average surface temperature. However, the temperature increases from right to left, which is very odd because we don't usually see that in um, graphs. But this is a special graph, like we said, it's been uh, plotted in a specific way so that we can see clear patterns of the star's uh, luminosity versus the temperature. So that's one of the key features to remember. Also, I tend to look at this graph and think that there is an F shape that's a little bit wonky with a little dash at the end. So that's how I remember it. So you should be able to actually sketch this graph roughly, briefly, like just, you know, quite a rough sketch of it. So doing an F line, a little dash at the bottom. <clears throat> and you can all, you also need to know uh, what each area shows. So in this area here, we have the uh, super giants. Here we have the, so we mean the red super giants. Uh, here we have the red giants. And this is the main sequence. So the, let me do it yellowish. So this yellow uh, part here is the main sequence phase. And you can see, and you also need to know, that our sun is roughly by the center of the little F-shaped looking uh, diagram. And then you can see the white dwarfs uh, in the corner, which you would expect them to have a lower temperature. So if you're ever, um, sorry, high temperature, um, and but very low luminosity. So you, if you ever forget, they do have high temperature because they still emitting quite a lot of uh, radiation, uh, but they're not as luminous anymore. So it's just about figuring out the right key features. The always the best way to start is to remember the axis that this one increases in the opposite direction, and then the quick shape of it. Um, and that usually helps. And then you have your super giants, red red giants main sequence and white dwarfs. So when um, Hertzsprung and Russell um, completed this, uh, plotted this data, um, they noticed that the graph didn't just uh, throw up a random scattering of points. It showed points that were clustered in distinct areas. And this turned out to be, you know, corresponding to different stages of a star's life cycle. So this diagram ended up being very, very important for studying how um, stars evolve and became known as the hertzsprung russell diagram. There are very distinct areas um, on the hertzsprung russell diagram and uh, it corresponds to the four main types of stars. So there's a long, this long diagonal band along the middle of the graph is um, where the luminosity increases with temperature it corresponds to the main sequence star. So we're talking about this central line here. Um, there's also a section with high luminosity but relatively low surface temperature. That's usually for um, the red um, supergiants. Um, we will also look at um, <clears throat> Wien's displacement law later, which will make a little bit more sense in terms of how they appear in different colors. 
Um, there's also another section uh, that at similar temperature to the red giants, but even at higher luminosity. Um, and then there's a fourth section where you have very high temperatures, but low lumin luminosity. Uh, so that's where you see the white dwarfs. You can also even um, comment on it in terms of the, you can even draw arrows on the diagram to show um, how ma how different mass stars evolve um, into, you know, the lifetime. So you could draw arrows showing it. So for example, for the sun, you could draw arrows on this diagram and show it that it goes from the sun to a red giant, then from a red giant it will expand, and then from this stage it will go to a um, white dwarf. Okay, so this is the section about um, stars. So we finished uh, the hertzsprung russell diagram. We said that it's a diagram that shows the luminosity with temperature, but the temperature being specially plotted the other way around. Uh, you also need to know the, where the main sequence, red giants, red super giants, and white dwarfs, white dwarfs can be found on that diagram. See you next lesson.